and welcome to episode 203 of From Paper to People, the podcast that teaches with lessons, interviews, and family recipes. This week we have an interview and I am truly thrilled to present it to you. I first became aware of Kenyatta Berry's work in 2013. Those of us in the Genie community and the Antiques Roadshow community were excited to have a show of our own on PBS, Genealogy Roadshow. Kenyatta was one of the three hosts. I was immediately struck with her openness and her ability to deliver the news to the guests on this show, whatever that news might have been, whether it was disturbing or it was odd or it was joyful. She shared in their emotions, but she also maintained a kind of professionalism and objectivity that was truly a model for all professionals. I was already interested in working professionally in genealogy and particularly in African-American research, but something about the way that she did the work and presented it made me want to move forward. I'd have to say that she is one of my major inspirations. Also, she knows a lot about a lot, so she is definitely someone to listen to and to learn from. That is means, as you can tell, that I am one of her fangirls. And I have to say, in all honesty, I sat here smiling and laughing throughout the entire interview. Kenyatta is on tour with a book she's written, The Family History Toolkit. We're very fortunate to have her here with us. I spoke to her just the other day. Here now is the interview. Welcome to the show, Kenyatta. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. So, what you been doing lately? Just oh. having cups of tea and looking out the window? <laughs> I wish. I've been pretty busy on my book tour um, called Conversations with Kenyatta for my new book, The Family Tree Toolkit, that came out in November of last year. And it's been doing really well, actually. We went into a second printing prior to release, which was great. It was trending as number one in category on Amazon, so number one in genealogy. And I've been selling books so far on my tour, and I've done about six cities out of the 20. Fantastic. How long does the tour go into? Well, as long as I can keep booking. So (laughs) um, at first, (laughs) we tried to do a very, you know, I'd hired a marketing firm. We tried to do a very quick kind of hits with, you know, one right after the other. But because it came out in November, we started in October, but then you start hitting to the holidays, which is always a very difficult time to get people to kind of commit. So I've stretched it out. So it'll probably go, I think, at least until June, but I am now starting to fill up and get a book for events up until the end of the year. And of course, I'll continue to sell my book while I'm there. Absolutely. Well, that sounds really, really good. Very exciting. exciting. Now, I bought the book, and I think it's a great book. Um, (laughs) Of course, (laughs) I think that it's an extraordinarily nice uh, book for beginners in particular, because Mm -hmm. the layout is so good. It's graphic. Mm -hmm. It appeals to the eye, especially for people like me who do think graphically. Mm -hmm. And so I've already recommended it to everybody. I'm recommending it again. But uh, I think it's really great. Now, who are you working with on this tour? So I am primarily now working with, um, so I have a couple folks. I'm working with Family Tree DNA and their exclusive DNA partner. And the reason I chose to work with Family Tree DNA is for a couple, couple reasons. Number one, they were my first DNA test that I took. So I did the mitochondrial DNA test. Oh. Um, I believe it's like 2009. I'm going to go with that year. Um, And so I really had a long relationship with them. The other thing I like about Family Tree DNA that most people don't know is they were the first consumer DNA company. Um, Started in 1999 and they offer the three DNA, three tests, right? So if you think about the DNA companies today, well, most people say, and I'm sure you've heard this, they've done their genealogy and I'm using air quotes, which means they've taken a DNA test. They're typically talking about, you know, those that advertise on TV. And we know that DNA is just part of the toolkit of doing genealogy. Um, With Family Tree DNA, what I like is that they don't actually sell your information. So we have all these privacy concerns that are coming up since the Golden State Killer. Um, So a lot of people are concerned about that. And Family Tree has made a pledge to not do that, to not sell your data to third parties or insurance companies or anything like that. So I really... Um, appreciated that. And I like the fact that they also have the option of not just the autosomal test, 
which everyone offers, but the mtDNA test to search your maternal ancestors and the Y DNA test. So really how I work with them is I have a nice little pop-up at Conversations with Kenyatta um, with their logo, and I actually participate in their conference as well, and then answer any questions in media as it relates to my relationship with them. That's really great. Yeah, the first test that I had anybody do in my family, because I was poking them with sticks and um, abusing them mercilessly, saying, please, please, please get your DNA tested. Um, I had my dad and my mother's brother both take Y DNA tests oh, through FTDNA. And um, I can't remember whether I got autosomal through them or whether I have done anything with them yet, but that's where I'm going next is right. um, because I did get my autosomal through Ancestry um, mm -hmm. because that was a natural place to go because that's where I have my tree. Um, mm -hmm. But definitely I'd like to do mitochondrial because my mom is deceased. I'd like to mm -hmm. do mitochondrial through there. I think a lot of people don't understand that there are three tests. And honestly, I'm no scientist. <laughs> right. I, did, I know nothing about that. And that's why I haven't touched it on this podcast. I'm trying to find professionals to come to discuss it with the audience because I just or with me because I can't do it myself. But I love that you have a confirmed relationship with the company like that. And especially that FTDNA has that pledge because we talked about Golden Gate and mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of people who don't understand um, the privilege that goes along with saying, oh, well, I don't care. Right. Right. And they don't. And I mean, and I think one of the things I want to clarify, I misspoke as far as working with them and we're going to be, I will be at Roots Tech this year and I will be with FT and DNA at Roots Tech. So I want to clarify that, um, which conference. Um, but yes, you're right. I think when you think about the Golden State Killer and everything that went on with Jed Match and everything we see today, it's like in the news constantly. Yeah. You know, I think as genealogists, we were just trying to get everyone tested. We had this little tool. We were super excited, right? Because you can get all these people. Yeah, they could be FTDNA. They could be ancestry 23 and me. And you got to just be cousins. And it was a very innocent thing. And even the gentleman who started it mentioned that. I think I briefly read a New York Times article about that. And, you know, we now find ourselves in what I like to call the Wild West, right, is what I felt like when I started doing internet genius or internet technology, excuse me, working um, back doing law about 20 years ago, where we're now saying, how do we deal with this? Mm -hmm. This is an unintended, unexpected consequence of uploading your DNA and people just having their trees and just trying to reconnect with their families. So we'll see a shift, I believe, in a number of folks thinking about privacy, understanding there'll be more regulation associated with it. Um, I think there'll be more pressure on the companies. There's a lot of push for DNA test because it's a, it's a quick and easy hit as far as some of the larger companies are concerned. But then, you know, if they don't have that pledge like FTDNA, then what's really happening with your data? And I think consumers will get really smart about that and start asking those questions. Yeah. Well, I've certainly heard those questions asked already and it is, it's a hot, topic on on uh, genie twitter um it's oh, something yeah. that people talk about and I, i'm always intrigued by who says what <laughs> right, right. i do my best to kind of sit back a little bit with that you know yeah. and sort of watch and see what happens so i don't know but anyway i i think that it's it's definitely a fascinating argument and law is a good 20 years behind all technologies so yes. i think I think it's yes. going to be real interesting to see where this goes next. <laughs> so. I agree. I totally agree with that. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the book process and, and how it is that you got into writing this specific book at this specific time. Yeah. Um, so it was an interesting process. I um, received an email uh, via my website at kenyataberry.com and it was from a publisher. And I'd never heard of the publishing company and they sort of said, we're interested in you writing a book. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. Is this for real? Because that never happens, right? People usually write a book and then they go shop the book around. So I was sort of like, what's going on here? And um, I looked the company up and it uh, is a company called Skyhorse Publishing out of New York. So they're not the traditional genealogy publishers. If you think of the books that we use every day that you have in your library, right? We have those traditional publishers um, and they're not part of that. And the gentleman that I worked with initially, Jason Snyder at Skyhorse said, I want you to write 
a toolkit. And I was really like, have you, are you sure? You know, why now? I was thinking the same question I had, like, why now? This was a couple of years ago. And really, he sent me a copy of the NARA, so the National Archives and Records Administration. They have a toolkit for their records. He kind of sent me a copy of that and said something along these lines. But really, it was sort of a blank slate. And I kind of just sat there. Once I agreed to do it, I had a book contract, but not a literary agent. Mm -hmm. So as a lawyer, I never negotiate my own thing. So now I had to find a literary agent. And in finding that agent, it was interesting because I just thought, okay, I got to get this together. Now what do I do? How do I write this book? So I had these big post-it notes all over my apartment, uh, (laughs) all over my bedroom apartment, the big ones that you write on. And I did chapter by chapter. And I thought, okay, what would I want? When I was starting 20 years ago, what would I have wanted that would help me out as far as doing research? So that's how I started the process. Right. So first I get the email from the publisher. I agree to do the book. I sort of see a guideline and then I say, how am I going to do this? Let me outline it and then begin the writing process. Oh, wow. (laughs) Post-it notes. My life is on the backs of envelopes. Yeah. I can definitely (laughs) get rid of that. The big big ones that you put on the wall. So (laughs) I could at least get a whole chapter a little bit of an outline on it. Oh, I absolutely love that. So so that's how it got started. Mm -hmm. How long did it take to write? So they're pretty, Skyhorse publishes books pretty quickly. So I probably signed the contract at the end of the year and then turned the book in uh, by mid-June. And at the time that I wrote the book, I was still working full-time in software sales. So I was writing the book at night on Mm -hmm. the weekends, and I'm sort of a perfectionist and a procrastinator, which is not a good thing. I don't (laughs) recommend it. (laughs) So it it was a process, but it took a while because once I wrote the book, and then there were some changes as far as editors, copy editors, and stuff like that, I did start to add to the book, which of course no publisher wants you to do. No. But I did because I said, if you're calling it a comprehensive guide, I have got to add to this book. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, this is not comprehensive. So I thought I had to add to it. So they, they were not happy about that, but I did it anyway. So that kind of added a couple months to the book. Uh-huh. Uh, but I'm glad, I'm glad with the, the final version, you know, when you're writing something, it's my baby. You know, it's your, it's the thing. And I'd never written a book before. I didn't, you know, I went to the libraries as part of my process. I went to Santa Monica library and I got all of these books written by John P. Coletta, Kathleen Hinckley, like books that I, if I had in my library or not, I got additional ones just to, cause I'm not known for European research. Right. I mean, I don't, I had to just kind of brush up on everything um, and give people just enough to get started. I don't, you know, the book isn't intended to be sort of me as an expert in all these areas, but it's intended for the beginner to kind of get a start. And then I provide them with specific resources for whatever area they're interested in. Okay. That's, um, (laughs) I just, I just can't get over the, the combination of the post-it notes and the, but wait, there's more. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly it. Exactly. It was it was a process. It's pretty much, uh, yeah. I mean, I get the feeling that if I ever did that, that's kind of how I would do it. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure, but mm. so <laughs> so. Tell me a, more about con- uh, conversations with Kenyatta. Yeah, so conversations with Kenyatta is something that I came up with based on um, my friends and I. I was I've been in marketing, and we kind of looked at it and said, okay, this is a how-to book, right? You know, it's, I'm not good. You've, you've read the book. It's not like I could read and tell people about my story, Mm -hmm. but it's really sort of a toolkit, a workbook. So how can I make this entertaining for people? Something that they, you know, answer some questions, something they would really want to walk away feeling like they could do this because genealogy research is overwhelming and it's confusing for the beginner. So conversations with Kenyatta is really an event, um, 20 city tour. Could be more, but 20 cities at this point. (laughs) Um, And as part of the tour, then I have someone interview me. Then a person interview me, interviews me for probably about 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, You know, I try not to, they can send me the questions beforehand, but 
I really don't care because I kind of think I like as a lawyer thinking on my feet. So I prefer not, you know, to get the questions there. And if I don't know the answer, hopefully they won't spring anything crazy on me, then I think I do fine. And, you know, we get an audience, they come there. Typically it's in the library, sometimes in a theater. And I've averaged about 100 attendees, sometimes as much as 150 people. And then we do Q&A and I answer the audience questions. Um, some of them, you know, are obscure, some things I don't know. Um, and I'll tell them that I'm not afraid to say that. And other times I'll refer people to the book. And then I do a a book sales and signing. So we, people can buy the book on site. Um, a lot of people bring the book with them and I then uh, sign the book for them. So it's about a two hour event. And, um, you know, I have typically the folks that sponsor me or that part of it, in addition to FTDNA, we have to have local folks. So, uh, genealogy societies, historical societies, um, sometimes a PBS station as well. Yeah, that's that's really cool and to me terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of going in and just being like, well, whatever's going to happen is going to happen and they're just going to throw it at me and I'm just going to be there to catch it. Oh, well, it's the... <laughs> It's the legal training. It's the legal training because if yeah. you have to think about it, when you're a, when you're a lawyer, you stand up and you give your opening argument and you do all of that. You do your questioning of the witness, but you don't know what the opponent is going to say or what the witness is going to say. You may prep them, but they could say something really different, right? Yeah. So you need to be able to think on your feet, and I think that training has really prepared me for something like this because not I don't think there's another genealogist that I know of that's gone on a book tour. So this is really new for our industry. Oh, I didn't think of that, actually. It's, I haven't really, I haven't really used books Mm, in my research, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, this kind of book, I mean, a toolkit kind of book. I mean, I've used brick and mortars. I started out using brick and mortars in my research 38 years ago, but I never really thought about that. Hmm, never really thought about that. Okay, so there's a question that's been floating around amongst Uh the members of my Facebook group, and they really want to know, is is the show coming back for another season? Oh, that's the question we always get. So um, I will say I don't know. We are in hiatus, as I like to call it, because we've not been canceled, and we have not been renewed. I am hoping that this book tour will help because it is getting the show out there. And a lot of times when I go to certain cities, they're rerunning the show. So for example, in Rochester, when I was there, because my family, at family there, they, you know, did reran all three seasons of Genealogy Roadshow after, okay. I, which was cool. So I'm hoping that this will gain some momentum. I think a lot of it has to do with funding mm-hmm. um, for the show. What people, you know, we have a team that works on the show, right? It's the three of us as hosts. We also have a team of researchers um, that work with us as well because we get a lot of people that want to be a Genealogy Road show. And at the time that we were filming, you know, Josh, um, all of us were working full time, but, spe- but I was working specifically as a software sal- salesperson. So I had no time to really kind of like screen anyone. Mm-hmm. And, and because the amount of stuff we get, we really don't do that anyway. We have a casting team that does that. So if you think about, I think people don't understand the amount of work and the number of people it takes to put on a show like Genealogy Roadshow. So funding, especially with someone like PBS, is always going to be a challenge. And given where we are kind of in our current funding state with the U.S. Mm. government. Yeah, yeah. Well, that definitely would not help. Well, there are definitely a lot of people who want to see it come back and probably more than one who wants to volunteer in order to make it come back. (laughs) Yes, I know. I know. Yeah. I wish it were that easy. I wish it were that easy. (laughs) Because, I mean, it's so funny. People are just like, oh, I love that show. Oh, my gosh. And then, yes. you know, they're turning their family members onto it and stuff. And everybody watches all the episodes and says, oh, no, there are no more. And I'm like, well, I, I know. Mean, I, I know. know. There might be. I don't know. We'll see. You know, you never can tell. You never um, can tell. And I always tell people to contact their local PBS station. Another thing that's different about Genealogy Roadshow is that we – you know, if you think of like Skip Gates show or you think of Ken Burns, both of those shows have a member station. And what that means is they have a local station, whether it's in or a station that is their kind of champion. So maybe they'll have like WGBH in Boston or they have someone else. We work directly with PBS headquarters. That's very different. Even when we went to PBS stations, they were like, What's, who's your member station? We're like, we don't have one. They're like, oh, really? 
So that's also the difference in our situation because we don't necessarily have a local or a station that's going and saying, why aren't you doing genealogy roadshow? right? What's taking so long? How can we get this funding? How can we do all of that? Um, so that's, I think, also uh, one of the challenges that we have. And then in television, working in television, a lot of people, um, the folks that work on Genealogy Roadshow, we try to get the same people to come back every year. But for those who don't know, in entertainment, they're mostly freelance workers. So they move on to different shows. You know, they could be working on Genealogy Roadshow, then they could be working on pit bulls and parolees the next week. Who knows? <laughs> True. So true. So, you know, it's, it's also like, you got to think of the number of advocates we have sort of working towards it. So I always tell people, write your local station, call them, let them know you want it on. And in that, hopefully that interest will bubble up to PBS corporate. Well, that sounds like a call to action, everyone. Uh, that's <laughs> something that we need to do. I could see doing that with Twitter, and I could see doing that um, on their Facebook page, and mm-hmm. I could see maybe a little email going out. And so that's something that all of us can do because it's a fantastic show, and there, I believe there are some episodes on YouTube, so I know that the international audience can watch it as well. Um, mm-hmm. It's just it's just one of the one of the greatest shows because it's just like the antiques road show in that it goes to fantastic locations that mm-hmm. have wonderful history and it looks at people's genealogy who are from that area and right. so it has this this wonderful historic setting in addition to being you know focused on the work that that needs to be done in, in this particular area, answering questions for, for people who have asked for help. And that's, I think, what makes it special. It's not just right. sitting in one place, sitting in one room. Which, right. and, and there's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, everything has its own special flavor. But right. this has a particular right. flavor that's very nice. So, mm-hmm. um, so definitely. Well, is there anything else that we need to know about, about what's going on? Where are you going to be soon? So I will be um, March 9th, <laughs> so I'm looking at March 9th, I will be, I'm like, wait a minute, because I was just looking at my calendar. Um, I will be in Oklahoma City. Actually, I'm doing their spring seminar for the Oklahoma Genealogical Society. Great. So I will be there. That's confirmed. I will give, you know, your listeners kind of the cities I'm looking at and so are kind of cities that are on deck, as I like to say. Okay. Uh, I am looking at Philadelphia, Seattle. Um, trying Portland, but that one may not work out as well. Um, the Bay Area, so that's San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland area, as well as Atlanta and Charlotte. So those okay. are cities I'm kind of negotiating um, with right now. And also, I will be May 2nd in Lake Forest, Illinois. And I'm doing a, the reason I'm doing Lake Forest, Illinois, is I have a genealogy series. And I'm not sure if folks remember, but in season two of Genealogy Roadshow, uh, Gail Lukasik was a guest and we were in St. Louis, I believe. And she came on the show and her mother, she, she's since, since written a book, but she came on the show because her mother had passed for white and she was mixed with African, Spanish and French ancestry from Louisiana. So her mother left as a young woman, New Orleans, and moved to Ohio and then passed as a white woman. Because in New Orleans, even though she had a very small percentage of African ancestry, she was still considered African-American. And Gail found this out doing research like we all did on microfilm and things like that um, and confronted her mother. And her mother basically said to her, she denied it at first and then Gail you know, pulled out the birth certificate and everything else she had. And her mom said, you can't tell anyone until I die. And when her mother died, four months later, Gail was on Genealogy Roadshow. So Gail lives in that area. And I wrote, Gail and I actually have, have a significant connection to each other because we have the same publishing company. And I wrote the foreword for her book. Um, and so she is part of the genealogy series there. And so she's kicking it off in Lake Forest um, this month, and then I'm coming in May. Oh, so that, that sounds great. Yeah, so I've always wanted to, I'm excited because I've always wanted to do something with Gail, um, because her, and you, her book is called White Like Her. I highly recommend you, recommend reading it. I won't do the spoiler alert for everyone. But, <laughs> um, it's a very unique story, and 
um, I really, you know, one that was one of the good things about being on Genealogy Roadshow is that you have these connections with people, right? And you really kind of, you know, and I just, when Miguel sat down, I just kind of knew. Mm-hmm. And I told her this when I went to her launch party, uh, December, I think, 2017. And I said, you know, she says, I'm so excited. I, nev- I never thought I'd write a book. And I said, I knew you would. She said, how did you know? And I said, I knew what I was telling you. I knew the information I was going to share with you as a writer would compel you to write a book. There was no way you couldn't. And it's been a great journey for both of us. So I'm super excited to see her. And hopefully Gail and I could do a tour um, and kind of talk about her experience on Genealogy Roadshow and the book. Oh, that sounds so good. That yeah. sounds really good. So is there any thought of you coming to New York? Yes. Um, New, oh, I did. I should have. New York City is on my list. Yes. Yay! For sure. Yes. New York. New York <laughs> is on my list. I took it, when I go to New York, actually, I just usually fly into JFK and then take the train to Rochester because that's where my family is, right? Okay. So that's where I go. But I will be in New York City. I, I'm working on that um, as well. So I didn't mention that, but that is definitely on the list. And, you know, thinking of venues as well. I mean, also, Josh is president of New York of GMB. When I've mm-hmm. spoken at there as well before. So I'm looking to do that. As you can imagine, the schedule's it's already February practically in my mind, right? I mean, the, the year has gone by so fast. So the schedule's yeah. filling up. But I'm definitely looking for um, when it's warmer. Right. <laughs> it's, that's, it's so that's, I, I absolutely recommend that. Um, <laughs> just, just so you guys know, we were going to do this interview yesterday. And um, I live on top of a hill and right next to the water, and Mm -hmm. um, the power went out. (laughs) I have no idea why, except that there was some wind, and and the power went out, and it was out all day, and so I I just had to text Kenyatta, and then I slept, because that was (laughs) all there was to do. I was sitting here in the dark, and I'm like, well, I'm just going to sleep. So, um, I mean, that was, and that's what happens here. So, you know, even whether it's cold or not, uh, that's pretty much what you get. So it's, it's definitely a good idea to stay away until it's a little bit warmer. I I would definitely recommend that. So that all sounds fantastic. And of course you're going to be at, I I wanted to say Roots Green. Why did I... (laughs) And then I then I was like Roots Magic, and I'm like, no, that's no, not no, it. No, not Roots Magic. <laughs> that's not Roots Magic. No, it's Roots, Roots Tech. Tech. There Roots. we go, everybody. Roots yes. Tech. You're going to be at Roots Tech, uh, yes. which is end of February, beginning of March. Yes. Yes, I will be there, and I am presenting. So I'm part of a expert panel, and then I have three presentations that I'm doing. One of my presentations, um, which I like to say is every day it changes, right? Because the other presentations are pretty much kind of, you know, historical kind of stuff about my family and different things. But the presentation I'm doing, the entrepreneurship track is really, is talking about jumping off a cliff and pursuing your dreams. And that changes every day as my (laughs) career path (laughs) changes every day. So the lecture, what I'll talk about leading up into that moment will probably change up until that moment, right? Because so many different elements, um, of what I'm doing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, do genealogy full time and not and not be sim- someone who's retired with a pension or has a spouse or or independently wealthy. I wish none of that to be able to do genealogy full time takes a lot of flexibility and juggling. Um, so that's going to be an interesting. That's one of the presentations that I kind of constantly think about as I fluctuate every day. But I'm excited to be at Roots Tech. I go. Um, it's my second time presenting there. Um, And I believe they're also going to be streaming um, one of my presentations as well. Great. Yeah. Great. Well, it sounds like you're a little busy. Just Uh, a tad. (laughs) But it's that good kind of busy. It is. It is a good kind of busy. It's the kind of busy that I couldn't do before. You know, most people don't realize, again, I was working full time the entire time I had filmed Genealogy Roadshow. I mean, most people thought that's all I did. So being able to just focus on something that I love and being able to control sort of my schedule and, and being able to do things like, you know, go to SLIG last week or be able to go to Roots Tech and not have to take time off or be on my other iPhone trying to answer emails or do calls just to enjoy genealogy um, has been great. And yeah, and I'm getting invited to speak a lot more, which is good because I'm available, but also that 
um, I'm not a traditional speaker. And what I mean by that is I don't really have a list of presentations. For those who want to invite me, I will get you some, but I don't necessarily <laughs> have a list. <laughs> I should, I'm one of those go with the flow type of people. And, um, you know, I don't know if there's a subject matter that I feel like I have a firm grasp on, I can talk about that. But it's, it's also, it's interesting to kind of be a part of the traditional genealogy speaking engagements, but I'm also stepping outside of that as well. I'm looking to speak at some of the other um, events like historical associations like AHA or the Library Association, ALA. I know there's a lot of genealogists that do that, but I haven't explored that area. So so that's something I'm looking at. Yeah, well, okay. You're going to be busy in the future then too. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) That's the goal. Got to keep busy. You are the woman who never stops. And I so appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you so much. Kenyatta Berry, everybody. Can you believe it? (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you. As you can tell, Kenyatta and I had a lot of fun with this interview. I hope you had fun listening. You can see her on her book tour at Roots Tech, even if you're not in Salt Lake City, because they are now selling virtual passes to Roots Tech. And you can buy the Family History Toolkit at barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com. Otherwise, let's flood PBS with requests to bring the show back for another season. They need to hear that we want it. Tweet to at PBS using the hashtag Genealogy Roadshow, though you can also add the show's Twitter account to your tweet. It's at Genealogy PBS. There doesn't seem to be an email option at the main PBS page, and emailing a local affiliate, as Kenyatta said, won't help. But you can use snail mail to write to PBS at Public Broadcasting Service, 2100 Crystal Drive, Arlington, Virginia, 22202. Thanks for listening. Until next time, do your research. Don't be a Jeffrey. Visit Kenyatta at KenyattaBerry.com. And above all, expect surprises.